Come with me on a journey. It's evening. The hall is dark, lit only by the rushlight and the great hearth. The people have feasted well. The mead has gone around. Stories have been told, songs sung. And now a poet stands by the high table and whispers right to the crowd. But here's Wolfstan, son of Raven, come from the north, where he has been scald to seven princes before. And others say, and now he is courtier to the great Baron William Lionsgate. And still others know more of him, that he is student to the great poet Shannon Lilaferty, worthy of fame. And as the crowd whispers amongst themselves, the smoke rises up from the hearth, and serpents of smoke dance among the rafters like the arm of some great beast. The poet takes up the harp and calls attention to the people. Quiet! We are Dana and Yardam. They all the king. Frim your friend, who the Ethelingas are in Fremadon. Oh, she'll shaping shaping a fertile morning a metal. Mere settle off to ya. Egg so the airless. Sit in airless wear. The hair shall find them. Wilkes and their wolf num. Where's Minden with that? There up and sit under over Franrad. Here in Shulda. Yomben Hilden. <laughs> that was God Keening. The Mayafra was after Keened. Young and Yardum. Don God send folk to Frafra. There and there on yet. But he er drug and alderlies long wheel. He in the Slayfria, Wolders Weldon, World Ara for ye, Beowulf was brain, Blay the weed it sprang, Shield the Zephra, Shed it and win. So as a young you, my god, you work in, from him to give them in Father Berm, but he in Elder, if you win again, will ye set us, but we who. Leoda, he lies them. Left item shall in Matthew Ware, Mania Theon. In his time, Shil departed, went into the keeping of his lord. The people in sorrow laid their master in a ship hard by the mast, and piled it high with treasures, with gold rings, coats of mail, fine swords, and boar hel proud helms. <coughs> and so, in their sorrowing, sent him off to sea whence he had come. No one, nor mighty man of arms, nor wise counselor in hall, can say for certain who unshipped that cargo or where he made landfall. After Shield Biao, his son, became king, ruled wisely and well for many years, and in time came his son, Hrothgar, to the throne. Now, Hrothgar was a great and mighty king, the greatest king ever to be known until the kings of Antir arose. <coughs> And few people have known such mighty heroes as their kings as Hrothgar, or Saverick, or Stierkar. And as a great king, he had a great following, a great host of men, and those who lived with him and <coughs> supported them. And for his great host, he thought, I must have a great hall to feast them and give rings, as a lord should do. And so he ordered Herot built, wide gabled, high rafter with horns spreading into the sky. And for many years, <clears throat> his hall was a place of mirth and mead and story and song. And people came from all across the northern lands to celebrate in Hrothgar's court. But there was one, an outcast, 
Grendel by name, of the kindred of Cain, the race of all monsters. He heard the stories, and heard the songs, heard men making merry with their mead, and he became jealous. And it came to his heart to destroy Hrothgar and his hall. Not in one fell swoop, but in pieces. For to destroy a lord, you destroy his people. So Grendel came to the hall. From near where he lived, approaching the gate. And when he got there, he devoured all that he could find. For twelve winters this continued, and Grendel would come nightly to the hall, and any he found inside, he would tear to pieces and devour. Hrothgar's folk abandoned the hall. By day he could hold his court there, but by night none would sleep within its walls. And as Hrothgar's reputation and his host diminished, so his despair grew. A hero of the northern lands, Beowulf, son of Ecgtheow, a famed Higelach, king of the wind-loving Geats, heard of his kinsman Hrothgar's plight. He consulted with the Witan, took counsel, and gathered to him a fellowship of fourteen men, had a ship fitted, and sailed for the Danish coast to save Hrothgar and his people from their dire distress. After two days, they reached the headland, were challenged, making landfall by the Danish coast guard, and when they had told him their names, their country, their kinship, and their quest, were conveyed to Hrothgar's hall. And there, the men stacked their spears, took off their high, proud helms, shrugged their shoulders in heavy mail, set their shields against the wall, and gratefully sat down upon a bench to wait the king's pleasure. When Hrothgar received them, <clears throat> he thanked them for coming, accepted them gladly, and Beowulf made him this vow, that as Grendel disdained the use of any weapons, so Beowulf too would fight with his bare hands, and God be disposed who would be the winner. But come what may, by morning, either Grendel or Beowulf himself would be no more. The people celebrated into the evening, but as the sun began to set, Hrothgar's folk grew nervous, started trickling away from the hall, for they knew what was coming. Soon, only the fifteen Geats remained, and of them, all but Beowulf fell into sleep. He alone, though lying with the rest, remained watchful. <clears throat> As he did each night, Grendel approached the hall. Burst the iron barred doors asunder, and there saw a host of mighty men. Ho <laughs> oh, ho he said, a good feast tonight. set upon him, and tore him limb from limb, blood spraying under the rafters, <clears throat> pieces of flesh flying, and he devoured him, even his hands and feet. Well, thought Grendel, that was a fine appetizer. The main course is next. And he reached down to the biggest, mightiest of the men. Oh, this must be their captain. I'll have fun with this one. And reached down to take hold of his arm. <laughs> and felt a hand grasp his arm in return. 
Now Beowulf had in his hands the strength of thirty mighty men. And as he laid his hands upon Grendel's wrist, the monster felt fear for the first time. This was no ordinary man. This was no simple piece of food in this hall. And he thought it must escape. But Bill stood and began to grapple. And as they fought, the hall was shook. Mead benches were cast aside, tables knocked over. And the very rafters of the hall were shaken, and were not such a mighty building as it was. It would surely have come crashing down. The gates were awakened, fell upon the monster with their swords. But Grendel was unspelled, so that no blade could harm him. But still, Beowulf's strength made him fear. And as they grappled, as Grendel hoped and tried to get away, a wound opened in his shoulder. It got wider and wider. Tendons popped, bones snapped, and his arm was torn completely from his body. Screeching with pain, the monster ran off out of the hall and back to the mirror, where he sank beneath the waters and died. In the morning, the Danish people came back to the hall, saw Beowulf and most of his companions live and whole, saw the blood on the walls, saw the furniture scattered, and knew a great battle had taken place. Then Hrothgar, king of the Danes, praised Beowulf and thanked him. Many rich gifts were brought to Beowulf and his companions fine harness of armor, boar proud helms, great swords, a golden standard, horses, shields, everything they could have imagined or asked, everything it was in Hrothgar's power to give them, for they had saved his people. Wealthia, the queen, too, passed the mead cup around first to her lord, and then to Beowulf and his company as the heroes of the day. And the bard struck up the harp and sang a new song of Beowulf's praise of his past exploits and the slaying of Grendel. <clears throat> and so after a day and a night and another day of feasting and stories and songs, Geats and Danes together, exhausted from their celebrations, lay down to sleep. Thank you.